Welcome back to Survivor Global on Reality Pop. We're talking about episodes five and six of Survivor uh, South Africa Island of Secrets. And we've got a very special guest here. I know I say special guest every time, but this time I am extremely excited to have Tanya Copeland from Survivor Island of Secrets here with us. Tanya, how are you? Hi, good morning, everybody. Fantastic. That's awesome. Now, Tanya, what have you been up to since you've played the game? You were such a great character on the season, and I know a lot of people really love what you brought to the show. Tell us a little bit about how life has changed since you played the game. Um, I'm, well, firstly, I'm not sure if it was great or weird, but either one, I'll, I'll take the great. Thank you. Um, well, I retired. I came back from Survivor and realized I never wanted to be in an office again. So I quit my job. I left the town that I was in. Um, my children all said, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. I did it. I quit my job and I left. So just before lockdown, I was in an off-grid home in the middle of the mountains in Montague. And it was the best thing I ever did because I would have collapsed financially if I'd stayed in Somerset West, stayed in the life I had. So survivors helped me in more ways than one. Not just the freedom to live the life I wanted, but also to leave the, the financial life I had. Yeah, I love Montague. Um, my grandparents lived in Montague for years, so I know the area really well. Um, now, Tanya, you had a lot of experience before you played the show, and um, a lot of that, I think, sort of brought a lot of confidence to you coming into the show. And I want to touch on it a little bit. You mentioned there that you've done white water rafting. Um, you were gu a guide in that. Uh, and you also mentioned that you were a mountain climber as well. So tell us a little bit about that and sort of how you felt like that would translate in the show and Survivor and how that would have been sort of an advantage for you coming into the show? Well, well, there were a couple of things. You know, I grew up on the water. I had a sailing, uh, I grew up in a sailing family. So I was very confident surfing, swimming, kayaking. Um, I hadn't dived before. I went for a couple of crayfish dives before the show. Um, so I knew I was confident in the water. I've always been fairly sporty. I started rock climbing at the age of 40. I'm now 53. So I've been climbing for the last 13 years. And, you know, surrounded by the Cape Town, Montague Mountains, the Western Cape is just a climber's mecca. So um, sport climbing, bouldering, traditional climbing. So, yeah, I figured I had a pretty good chance. You know, they see old, I see a wise and sort of experienced person. But unfortunately, that doesn't always translate. Old is old at the end of the day. And when you're older than the pack, it doesn't really matter what experience you have in life. you just got to scramble. <laughs> uh, Tanya, have you have you travelled uh, a bit around the world, or have you predominantly always been in South Africa? Uh, no, I'm actually British. Um, so I came out British. here at the age of 22. I lost my driving license for six months and um, packed my surfboard and came to South Africa to surf. So that's how I ended up here. But um, no, I lived in Rome for a year. I've lived in Zimbabwe. I've lived in Zambia, and and here I am now in South Africa. So. I'm a, no a native, but I feel like I'm totally home. This is my home, South Africa. Yeah, so so I'm like I, I'm an amateur rock climber, um, but I could definitely yeah. relate about like when it comes to rock climbing. Like I love rock climbing, but it's mainly indoors. And um, what I find is that as soon as you get to the bouldering stage, is when it gets very very difficult real quick. I'm okay until it gets to that point. But um, I do love doing like you'd see. I've got the Spartan um, shirt on here. I do love doing my obstacle course races, and having done a bit of rock climbing has definitely helped in obstacle course races as well. When you when you do those things, so I can see how that would have been something that you would have thought yes this is definitely going to help me in a show like survivor because there's so much obstacle course race type elements to it what did you think of the challenges when you were on the show loved it i mean it's everything you hope it's going to be it is an adult playground it was just amazing and you know jumping off the one platform despite being a climber i'm still scared of heights so jumping off the one platform into the water that was a biggie for me you know i could i knew my kids were sitting at home going oh my god mom please do it please do it <laughs> but it was, it was brilliant. I mean, it really is like a child being in a, in a toy shop. You just get to play wild. The hardest bit is actually when you get back to camp and you've got to deal with personalities. The, the most fun is definitely going out there and playing. And I think that's what we go there for. We go there for the games. I mean, who doesn't want to play those games? 
100 percent. now i spoke to your previous tribe mate um and also probably your closest alliance member ting ting about a week ago um and she obviously mentioned that you know i asked her how big of a fan were you when you played the game me being ting ting how big of a fan was ting ting when she played and she said if i had to rate myself between jack and uh, tanya i would be somewhere in the middle so i kind of picked up with what she meant there's that you weren't necessarily the biggest fan prior to playing the game is is that true or did you actually watch no, survivor no. before coming on no 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 i've been watching survivor for 20 years i've never missed the season you know i actually okay. applied the very first season in south africa i applied and i raced down to my office at eight o'clock on the sunday night and my computer was so slow i was trying to download a photo and my computer crashed and that was it i never got my application in and i haven't had a tv for years so i go to other people's homes and i don't know if we're allowed to say it but you know people send me links and i watch you know i stream it but no, I've never missed. I watch all the New Zealand ones, the Australia. I watch every survivor out there in the English language. So I'm a big fan. I maybe, you know, I smoke a lot of marijuana, so I don't have a great memory. I don't remember all the tricks of things I'm supposed to do. But no, I'm a big fan. Big fan. Jack now, if you Jack is a mastermind fan, I was just maybe the, yeah. the more comfortable fan. I don't remember people's names, but I remember the games. I had Jacques on the, the podcast um, a, a while ago to talk about one of the Australian Survivor episodes and he dissected it with me and his mind, I could just immediately tell he's extremely switched on. Yeah. And, yeah, and you you really time. targeted you re, you really targeted Jack towards the end of this um, second episode where you were voted out as the person to try and see if you could sort of pin the votes on him because he was the person in your mind that was going to win the show at the end if he got there. Did you truly believe that if he got to the end, he would have won the show? Or was that more uh, you trying to put a target on him to try and get him voted out at that stage in the game? It was both, you know, I didn't know the other members that I hadn't been in tribes with. So I could only base my knowledge on the people I'd come across. And he was most definitely the shrewdest player I'd come across. Um, he was just two steps ahead of everybody else. He really was. And he's very unassuming, you know, he wasn't one of the big guys. He wasn't a big threat. He didn't look like the, the classic, you know, model sitting on the beach in his, you know, jockeys. Um, I just, I mean, I warmed to him. I really, I did. I, I connected with him on day one. I was just so disappointed that he didn't connect with me on day one because I think Ting Ting Jacques and myself might have had a chance. But unfortunately, it was Ting Ting and Jacques. It was me on my own and then it was the rest of the group. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely supported Jacques. He was my number one because I really do feel, even sitting at home and watching it, I felt he had the best chance of winning. Yeah, because that's going to be one of the questions that I was going to ask you. You know, you went to the Island of Secrets thanks to the Solar Tribe sending you there um, to to sort of save your butt a little bit there um, and that vote. But, you know, you go there and you get this amazing opportunity. And this is one of the things I really love about Survivor South Africa is they're quite creative in their twists. Like the US Survivor seasons, it seems like they just throw idols out there to try and, you know, make the game a big gamble. But in the Survivor South Africa season here, they give you the choice of either going back to the camp immediately or you could stay there for the night you made a great choice by the way to stay there so it clearly shows your read was right um you know the show tried to say that you weren't that aware of what your position was in the game mm. at that point but you clearly knew where you were at um and you go back and you choose to go to the la may tribe um the one that had felix and both jack in there and i was quite interested to know why you chose felix and jack as the tribe to go to opposed to like a dante and meryl who you also played with um earlier in the season um can you elaborate a little bit on what your sort of thought process yeah. was it was it was actually much simpler my first choice without any doubt was going to be top hauling that was it it was so bloody cold i've never been so cold in my life i don't know if you noticed but i'm the only female in the cast that didn't have a jersey i froze mm. my butt off out there you know some nights i couldn't sleep because my teeth were chattering so for me my first priority was look at the two teams that the two tribes that have got top hauling and then make my decision so that's where the coin was going to lie. And when I looked at the two, I realized that if I went with, um, uh, what's his Quirvis, name? Quervis, yeah. If I went with Quervis, it was going to be two. And we weren't going to have the numbers. So at least if I went with Felix, yes, and Jacques, it wasn't because who, it could have been any two of my original Ta'alos in there. I knew I was, I knew I then had the numbers and that could just sway me for one or two votes. I knew it wasn't going to last because I couldn't fucking stand Felix. Sorry, Felix, but, you know, he'd really pissed me off by that point. I'm, 
I, I am a loyal person. And, you know, if you did that to my buddy, I would have done the same. So I was sticking up for myself there because nobody else would. Um, so, yeah, it was number one tar tarpaulin. Keep me dry. And number two there, we had the numbers. But I never, ever was going to play a numbers game. And I even said that in, you know, the thing that my kids are going to be so pissed off that I'm playing numbers here. And of course, that was the night I voted Felix off and it felt so good because they would have been so proud of me. I could have gone with numbers further. But for me, as a fan, that is the worst game I want to see. And in some ways, you know, that's that's the game that Rob played. He had he had his numbers all the way through and kudos to him that everybody jumped on his bandwagon and gave him those numbers. But the most exciting part for the season were where the guys kept picking at that order, saying, come on, guys, we can't let him walk away with us. We can't let him walk away. And I sat in my lounge every week saying, please go with Jacques or go with Quirbus or listen to Dante. Or, you know, I just wanted somebody to break that, that numbers game. And I certainly wasn't going to be a part of it, although it looked like the first couple of votes in that tribe that that's where I was going. But it wasn't that. It was never going to be that. Yeah, because for me, Dante came across as that player that really was onto Rob's game very early on in the season. And obviously, you weren't on the tribe with him where he stole the flint and he hit the flint away from Rob to try and weaken his his psyche because he was the fireman that always needed to make the fire in the tribe. But, you know, I, I was the same as you. Um, Jark was arguably like I, I really respect the hell out of Rob's game I reckon Rob is one of the best winners if not the like he, he's seen by a lot of super fans as one of the top three winners to ever win the game in any version of the show US Australia whatever and, and I mean it's because of the hold that he had on the tribe I would still love to see Rob play from a position of not being in power because that would be an interesting game to see because Jack on the other hand was probably my favorite player throughout the season because he was the underdog he made so many mistakes early in the season he had to rectify it to try and get deep into the game how could you not love the underdog story Absolutely. dante was another person i really enjoyed dante's game as well you know and um, i wanted to know a little bit more about you know um what was your relationship like with dante and with merrill because early on you know we see you trying to make quite a few alliances and you're right in the sense that you know if you don't get in there first then someone else might form those relationships and you know you, at one point you had merrill potentially in a girls alliance and you also had at one point dante with quivers in an alliance there with you um do you feel like things could have been different if you were to join Dante and Merrill? Do you think they would have been more loyal to you compared to what Felix and Jack were, or do you think it would have been the same outcome? No. I mean, if I could have chosen my my dream sort of group in that tribe, I, it definitely would have been Jack and Tintin. Mm -hmm. um, and let's face it, it's Survivor. I don't give a shit who the other person is. As long as I've got my four, um, I would have been happy. But you know, I, I felt I connected with everybody in some way. Felix was very like, he, he was on a rugby scholarship and, you know, just a thoroughly nice guy. He's, he's intelligent. He's really what we want South Africa to move forward as, strong black African leaders. That's what everyone's mm. crying for. And I, I felt that I tried to connect with Felix like that. He reminded me of one of my kids who, who also had a very similar background. I tried to connect with Jar, tried to connect with Tintin, and it didn't really matter where I went there. It was very obvious from the get-go, even from the sleeping arrangements, that everybody cuddled somebody and I was kind of left on my own. Um, Ting Ting did graciously give me her legs, so at least, you know, our legs could wrap, but not one person put their arms around me until I came across um, you know, Stipe, who, who very generously gave me a shirt. So I knew on, on day one that, you know, the girls, the girls are pretty and they're young and they relate to the guys in a different way. I was hoping to come in on that mother thing. You know, I got seven kids behind me, foster kids, and I can relate to just about all of them. Um, but it just didn't happen. And I was really surprised that that social game was so hard. I thought, A, mm. they would see the, the value of my, my sporting strength. B, they would see the value that, you know, I could bring as a social player. But, you know... Again, if, if I'd have been in different tribes, I've since, you know, connected with guys that were in the, the original Lao Mei. I mean, Jeff was the first person to contact me outside of the game. And we became very friendly, you know, on WhatsApp. And we've got so much in common. And he said, if only you had been in our tribe, I would have loved to have had you here. So, you know, it's just the way the, the cookie crumbles. And I can, you know, on day one, I thought I could see how the tribes were split. We had those beautiful big people in Rob's tribe. 
And then we had the, the, the weird sort of leftovers in our tribe. We were like <laughs> people and we could barely do that coconut game. I mean, none of us were tall enough. And then you had this, you know, middle pack that were the, the go-getters, the, the, you know, the, the javelin throwers and the lawyers and the things in that middle Lao Mai. So it, it was an interesting split. And of course, I sit there a million times and think if I'd have played the numbers a little bit further, um, if this, if that. But there is it, you know, I got to play and that's all that's really important. It was brilliant. And whether you're there, OK, you might have been devastated one day, but, you know, if you're there anything more than one day, it's a dream come true. And I, that's what you take away. And the fact that I was there two weeks and I came out number six, my name was down there for number one. If we'd have lost the first two, I was out. So every day I got after that was a bonus. And um, lots of interesting people that I think I could have connected with. I would have loved to have seen Jeff and myself playing together. Animals and marijuana, I mean, what a combination. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's really interesting hearing your perspective on this. And even before I did the interview with this, I was, one of the questions I was going to ask is, you know, do you regret anything? And I was like, Tanya's not going to regret anything. Tanya seems to be that person that really just takes everything as it comes. And no matter what it is, you know, you went into this game with an extremely positive attitude and a real belief in yourself, you know, in regards to what you brought to the table. And I think that's strong personality being someone that is a leader in their everyday life probably didn't mingle so well with other strong personalities like Dante um, obviously I heard he was a bit of an introvert but he was still a very strong personality you had Felix who was a strong personality Quibus who was an extremely strong personality it just seemed like you ended up landing in quite a volatile tribe from the start and to try and be a leader or a leader figure in that tribe was never going to go down too well for you um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that you know you had a lot of self-confidence coming into this game what does that come down to what has given you this confidence because you mentioned in your mind you're a giant even if they see you as the small person you're a giant in your mind and me personally i love that attitude in life i think it's dangerous in survivor but in life that's a, that's a winner's mindset but i want to know a little bit more about like what gives you this confidence coming into the game like what if you sort of it has to come from somewhere you know because a lot of people do not believe in themselves yeah, I actually don't know. And and just after lockdown or just during lockdown, when South Africa opened up for a couple of months, one of my childhood friends flew out from the UK and said he'd rather be stuck here in South Africa. He's been here now six months. And the last time I saw him and hung out with him, you know, it was from the age of 10 to the age of 16. And I said, Simon, was I such a positive person then? Because I've actually had quite a shitty life. Where? Where did my, my, my belief and my confidence come from? And he said, no, you've always been like that. So I don't know. I think some people are just inherently born with positive vibes. And I look at things and know there's an opportunity. And definitely my age comes into it. You know, at 53, I don't give a shit if somebody thinks my tummy sticks over my bloody shorts. I know I look flipping good for my age. I know I can put a lot of youngsters to shame. So my, my knowledge, my intelligence, self-belief. I believe in women in general. I believe in the planet in general. I believe in good people. Um, mm. Does it help in Survivor? No. I mean, Jacques, who I wanted to connect with, thought the story about my father being a bank robber was, was a lie. I mean, why would anybody go on national TV and say a lie, for God's sake? So yeah, it was a pity they didn't see the interesting side, but I am just a positive person and I love people. I probably love dogs more than people, but I love people too. I've got to now, as someone, <laughs> now, 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 as someone that you, you mentioned, you, you've actually watched quite a lot of the seasons. There's a lot of comparisons in the international circles between international fans, uh, between yourself and someone like a Debbie Wanner or like a coach type of character. Um, do you do you find that flattering to be like sort of because you know, those are big characters? They've both come back more than once. Um, you know, coaches loved, by the way. Like you know, obviously you had a lot of crazy stories out there, and all of those kind of things. Did you find it flattering or were you put off by the fact that you were being compared or have you even known that some people Look, compare you to those types of characters on the show? I, I have no idea. You know, I'm not very socially media active apart from Facebook yeah. and the people I know. So I've got no idea. My kids would send me things that, you know, when people referred to me. Debbie, I'd be flattered. Coach, I used to sit here and cringe when Coach told his story and the yeah. fact that you've likened to me to him and I'm thinking, oh my God, did people really think that? But you know what, at the end of the day, it took me a while to watch my season. 
Um, obviously to watch the rest of it was no problem, but to watch me and I am the weird one. And that, that's disheartening in some ways because you, you watch it and you think it's the weird one that sticks out. It's the weird one that goes. And that's such a shame. I thought I was going to be portrayed differently, but that is who I am. You know, we, I am weird and some people love that and some people hate that. So Lycan to Coach, maybe because of the storytelling, I've always, that's me, that's, I've just judged him. I've judged him as probably not being, you know, embellishing on them. So I'd hate people to judge me there, but Debbie, strong woman, yeah, I'd be flattered. <laughs> Yeah. No, no. The thing with coach is that, you know, if, if whenever fans talk about a legend season, because there's a lot of talks about we've had winners at war um, in season 40. They've said that winners at war potentially would have been a legend season before CBS pulled the plug on that and said, no, we're doing winners instead of a legend season. Any fan casting when it comes to a legend season has got coach as one of the top three males to come back in that. So I think you should look at that mm -hmm. as a very positive thing because, yes, coach is a different character as well. He's someone that's out there. But also I've heard from people who have met coach in real life that he's very different when you meet him in real life to the character that sometimes is portrayed on the show. And it's not that he's potentially going out there to lie. It's just when you're out there and you're creating a TV show, you know, I think coach is the first person to really create a persona for him around that. And, you know, the, the whole you going to Island of Secrets, coming back with a cane the walking stick walking back into the island i don't know if you decided to do that on your own or if production told you to do that but coach did the exact same thing when he went to the exile um in his season he came back with a walking stick after that so there were these certain things that people pulled back and they sort of said oh there's some comparisons there you know i think i think what is fun watching somebody like coach and maybe for you guys watching me is that because we're a bit weird it's unpredictable um, anything could happen. We are eloquent. So, you know, we, we come out with stupid and funny and sometimes intelligent things to say. Um, but there's always a bit of controversy. You know, we're not the person who's going to sit there and be quiet. If something's wrong, we're going to say it. If somebody's sitting on the beach sunbathing, we're going to say it. We know it's, we know it's wrong to get into that argument, but our character is why the fuck would you sit there when there are jobs need doing? You know, why would yeah. you not try and dry wood? Why would you just give up and say, we can't make a fire because it's wet? Bloody dry the wood. And and that's his character. So that it's interesting for, for the, the viewers to see those sort of characters. We don't want the yes men. We do want people who cause a bit of a wave and and it's unfortunate to be part of the wave, but I do get it. I mean, one of the, and by the way, the, the um the crew never ever direct you on what to do so nobody ever told me you know pick up that or do this or try that that's that's a myth that follows survivor there is nothing scripted what what is scripted is that the, the parts they choose to show but of course everything that came out of my mouth came out of my fucking mouth of course it did so <laughs> yeah i understand we need those weird players and we need controversy because it makes it so much more exciting i don't want to see I don't want to see the numbers game. I don't want to see returns. I want to be new. I want to, I want new experiences, new people, new new clashes, new fire ups. That's what Survivor's about. I want to be on the edge of my seat. I don't want to predict it. 100%. I'm going to say it's better to be remembered than to be forgotten, you know, and in your Absolutely. case, you definitely will be remembered as a player in Survivor South Africa. And you never know, you know, if they do a Survivor All-Star season over there, you know, always think, oh, you know, people that, ha you know, the only way people will come back is if they've made the merch, but the production team knows what they're doing when they're out there. I would say someone like yourself who had a very big character in the show and a big sort of early pre-merge um sort of arc in the in the actual game would have a chance like i don't know where that would be in the picking order but they would think we need someone to mix it up we can't have a a, a group full of robs and verners out there who's going to win the whole thing the whole time will be very neutral we're going to also need people that are going to shake it up so i think overall that should be seen as a, as a very positive now i did want to touch on the fact that you mentioned that um you are a fan of the show Who, who's your favorite players that you've seen sort of play the the game do you do you have any favorite players um over in the u.s seasons that have played um yeah but again my memory is not great i'm not great with names you know i That's obviously yeah. i know the big ones like sandra and rob and while i respect their wins i'm not big fans i, I don't want to see returns i want to see new people so i tend mm -hmm. to go with the underdogs you know i love season six winner for us because he was an yes. underdog Tom, 
Tom was the me. Tom was fighting against everybody who didn't want him to be there and he was bloody good. So I like the underdogs. I love the, the librarian, the little girl, the New Zealand woman who won. Yes. She won a couple of seasons ago. Those are the yep. kind of players I like. And then of course, I love the beautiful, you know, the Aussies and, you know, they, they also play a great game because they're so on top of it. So I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a name for you. That's crap memory, but I could show you faces of people that I've thought of have been great. I, yeah. The only people I tend not to like are the numbers and I don't like the returns. I've seen them. I've loved them in their first season, but I don't want to love them every time. I want, I want to love somebody new. Yep. No, so that's fair enough. Gameplay. I, I just want somebody new to win it. You, you've won your million now. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair enough so you i mean only 20 people get the chance so why why should they give the space to you again and you know i'm a hypocrite if they came and knocked on my door tomorrow you're damn right i would be there but i would be disappointed if rob was because he's won you know why wouldn't you give somebody else an opportunity and in my heart i feel that all 20 should be brand new players so that would that would penalize myself in my heart, that's the way it should be. It should be totally new people every time. And you know, every season will give us the people we love and the people we're gonna root for. In my season, I was definitely rooting for Stipe because in my heart, I knew she was somebody I would love. And um, Jacques, because I thought he was so shrewd. So they were definitely up there for me. Um, but every time somebody did that little nitpick at Rob, they were my favorite that week. Because <laughs> I wanted to see those numbers break. I wanted to see something unexpected. No, 100%. And I was going to ask you a bit about Sipe. You know, you, you're seen as having quite a close relationship with her on the show. And I'm sure the fact that Sipe was on that tribe as well as Jack was another reason that you probably gravitated that way. Did you know that Sipe was someone you were going to click with even before you went to that tribe? Was there that unspoken rule just by the vibe that you were getting from her? Or, or did that just, that bond sort of... It was sort of more there when you actually got on the tribe and you got to know Sipe. Um, I don't know where it came from. You know, when I came in, my children did a lot of research for me because they're more Google wise, you know, and they're going, mm. mom, you know, statistically, the person who's going to least like you is a black woman. So that was their, their sort of, you know, the black guys are like you, the white guys are like you, but, but the black women are not going to, there's some resentment there, they're not going to like you. I saw Sipe at Fiji airport and I thought, I wonder if she's a player and she looked really fierce. And I thought, oh no, I, mm. I must stay away from that girl. You know, she could eat me for breakfast. And then she was on the opposite tribe and it didn't, you know, we don't get to see the other tribes at all. So I've got no idea of the dynamics there. And then Sipe and I were one-on-one -on -one in that little water wrestling challenge. And I really, I mean, she's a, she's a big, strong girl. And I, I just felt so pleased that I'd done well there. And the next day that I, or the next time we played, she said, said something like, well done to me. And I, I thought, well, that's such a nice thing to say because, you know, that was a tough battle for both of us. And just the fact that she'd recognized that that was a tough battle for me, they could obviously see I was the, the man down. Um, that meant a lot. And I said, thank you in return when they sent me off to, to the Island of Secrets and to see that played on air where they were like, oh, what a nice girl. You know, she actually said, thank you. So I think mm. there was a mutual connection at that moment, that moment that we fought in the, in the water, there was a mutual respect. And that then translated into me having that second opportunity. And without any doubt, I don't think it was the rest of the tribe. That was Sipe single-handedly that said, we are sending Tanya. Um, I, I put that squarely on her. And I would have been very disappointed if she hadn't been in my second tribe. And that was the, the only, I mean, yes, I got the tarpaulin and yes, I had the numbers, but once the, the mental game, that the mental decision had been made, my heart was really happy because I thought I did feel like I had a friend in that tribe. And she was the one I looked at as I walked towards them with my smile. It wasn't the numbers in the tarpaulin. That was my mental game. My heart was saying, for the first time, I'm gonna have somebody, I can actually just put my arms around and say, fuck, this game is tough. And just uh, yeah. have somebody in my corner, you know, that's so important. You know, the game is, is so bloody hard. 
that to do mm. it on your own is even harder. And the easiest time I had was those two days on the Island of Secrets because I didn't have to worry about anybody else and I knew I was strong. But being strong in a group of people where you're the outcast is really hard. And that's maybe where I connected with Tom's when that, you know, and Jacques, I mean, everybody actually went through it being part yeah. of the numbers game in our season, you know, they were outcasts and my heart broke for them because I just feel if you can't put your hand out to somebody when times are hard, I mean, they knew I was out first. I knew I was out first. So why can't you just be nice? You know, it doesn't cost you anything just to say, fuck, you look cold. Come, let, you know, let's just hug and share our warmth. Or, you know, it's those little things that make the whole, it makes life go go on. And, you know, maybe I think that, but not everybody else. No, I 100% I hear where you're coming from. And, and one of the people that really seem to struggle with the whole embracing other people or having that human connections with them and again it might be the show because as a super fan or someone that's watched a lot of these seasons I probably get it more than the casual fans out there that we only see a very small snippet of what happened every single day so I could be judging this person completely wrong based on what I've seen on the tv but Felix seemed to be one of those people that really struggled to connect with other people and I don't know if it was like he said he really didn't get along with a lot of the people that he landed on the second tribe with and his closest allies it seemed were Dante and Merrill potentially and he ended up being split from them um you know Felix is a person on around the camp and there was he constantly that person that was just annoyed at everyone bossing them around and we saw in this episodes that I'm going to be recapping at the end of this podcast that you know he really goes hard on Jack for not being able to complete the slide puzzle as well um, and he sort of complains to you um, while Jack is trying to to do this and he and he has some really bad fighting words which ultimately is the reason that you know Felix get voted out before you is because Sipe says that she can't deal with someone that's a, a negative person in the tribe um can you speak a little bit to that? Like, I don't want to be too critical on the guy. Like, he's out there, he didn't have food. Maybe a lot of things played to that. But do you have some additional insights for fans, potentially, that maybe didn't see that on the TV show? From my perspective, I thought Felix was, like, in the popular group. He was part of the he was part of the A team in my tribe, Ta'alu, because I mm. was on the out. You know, to me, it was them. It was, it was Jacques, Dante, Merrill, and Felix. They were four. And I didn't, I assumed that Jacques was probably on the, on the, on the number five there and that Tintin was six and I was seven. So to me, he was part of the A team. So I'm surprised. Yeah, he was definitely on the outs in the second tribe. I didn't know he didn't have a good relationship with Jacques. When I joined those two, mm. I thought it was Jacques and Felix plus me. I yeah. didn't realize there had been that split at all because I was never part of that tribe, that, that in group. Um, so no, Jacques was not an, uh, I mean, Felix was not an unliked person. He was actually a really, I, I tried to suck up to him. I wanted to be his friend on day one. Um, so yeah. he wasn't a nasty person, but he did come along with some stereotypes, you know, male and female roles. You do that, I'm going to sit here and watch you, or I'm going to say it because I'm a man and you're a woman, or... You know, there were a couple of little things that slipped in there. I think, um, funnily enough, you know, if I said, come, let's get the fire going, he wouldn't even turn his head to acknowledge that he'd heard me. And then I would I would go back and I'd say, Sipe, please, can't you get them together? We, we need to get this fire going. And Sipe would walk mm. out and say, come, guys, let's get the fire going. And Felix would jump up. So, you know, culturally, maybe he respected Sipe more than me. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was a game. I held a personal grudge because I had a fight with Felix on day two about sitting in his patch of dry shelter and he felt mm -hmm. that we shouldn't share it. And I just thought that was an arsehole, you know, whether you like me or not, if somebody's in need, you know, you, you sitting there with a fucking Jersey, just share, you know, I, to me, that was just beyond me. And I would have stood up for anybody. If, if that had been Ting Ting asking for the dry spot, I would have caused that argument by saying, Felix, you're being an arsehole, give us some give us some space. I would have done that regardless, whether that had pinned, pinned me down or not, because that's who I am. But I have to tell you, at the finale, Felix was the one cast member who came over to each of my children who were there and said, 
please don't take this personally. I didn't dislike your mother and the rude things I said did not come from my heart. I actually respect her and I love her and please forgive me for anything I said. And he spent maybe two hours at that finale talking to my children and that's huge. So I actually walk away with a special love for Felix. You know, when mm. I refer to the arsehole, I'm talking about moves he made in the game. I'm not talking about the man. I have huge respect yeah. for the man. And if he phoned me tomorrow and said, I want to come to Paternoster and have a free holiday, I would say, what dates would you like to come? Make mm. no mistake. So That's amazing. I, I, kudos to, to Felix. Did he do everything right? No. Did everybody do everything right? No, of course they didn't. No, and I mean, this is the whole thing, right? Uh, this is a game at the end of the day, and I think a lot of people don't don't realize that when they when they go out there and play it. And um, uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you as well is, you know, you mentioned there that Felix and yourself, you kind of patch things up towards the end there. Are there other people that you've become um, good friends with afterwards? You've mentioned Jeffrey has, has sort of reached out to you because at the end of the day, the game is one thing, and then after the game, you know, you'd hope that people would be able to put things aside. I know it's harder for other people that got a lot deeper in the game and maybe feel like they were betrayed a lot harder towards the end there but what, what's your relationships like been like with the, the the actual cast themselves after the show um well just not even after the show you know getting together for, for the finale it was interesting to see that you know apart from um, mike and jeff the, the other people that i hadn't come across during the show didn't make an effort to come and say hi I still mm. felt like the outcast. Um, from my original Ta'alo, you know, the brohos, they didn't come over with the exception of Felix. Meryl didn't come over. Um, Dante didn't come over. Corbus didn't come over. None of them even so much as greeted me. So I still had a very small tribe at the finale. I had Sipe and Jeff and Mike. Um, Leanne but I think you know she was also on the out so maybe she she clung to me there and it's been the same since we've left the show um it's only really those people that chat to me Sipe said something to me just a couple of days ago on Facebook she said something about missing you and and I messaged back and said get on your bike and sorry my dogs are gonna bark gonna go okay. into a now. um so I said to her you know get on your bike and and come to Padnostra so I still chat yeah. to Sipe every now and then but I wish it was I wish it was a case of people saying, you know what, it was a game and we all experienced it together. I mean, Meryl made some comment on our on our WhatsApp group the other day that there's a get together in September in Cape Town. Nice. Nobody mentioned it to me. So oh. I think there's still I think there still are lines, which which is really sad because we've been part of something really special that I will treasure forever. And you know, my biggest rival enemy in the game was Felix and I, I think he's a stand-up guy so I think it's a shame that Meryl and, and Dante or whoever's organized this feels that I'm not important enough to invite because I am I was I was a very big part of six episodes and it's it's a huge part of my life and and where I am today and I'll they can't they can't negate it to me, it was huge. I'm still that bloody giant that I said I was. I'm still that's that such giant. a great attitude. I've been the giant in my life. So it's like paying it forward. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to just again say it's such a great outlook in life to be like that. I feel like a lot of people, um, you know, again, me being the the Survivor fan here, I'm going to geek out a little bit here and talk about Survivor Winners at War Season 40. Tyson Apostle, really great character over in um, the American version of the show, gets voted out, goes to Exile Island and talks about the fact that when certain people get voted out of the game, it destroys their life. They become bitter afterwards for years and other people can take it on the chin and realize that it's a game. And I feel like um, you're one of those people that have taken it really positively. Um, you know, the fact that it is a game, it is over things happen there. Um, you, you've righted things there with Felix, which is great to hear, or Felix coming over to your kids and having that conversation. I'm really glad that we got that bit of information it also puts Felix in a completely different, you know, I didn't think badly of him because I, I look at it and I know that there's such a limited amount of time. And like you said, the show won't put words in your mouth, but the show can definitely hype up certain aspects of a, a person's personality based yeah, on what Felix, happened on the island. So, Felix yeah, 100%. Is a 
You know, we, we saw battle Felix, but in real life, Felix is a softie and he cared. Nothing and that's the second him. time now I've heard it. Ting Ting said exactly the same thing. She said he's a, a, a he's a really soft person, really, if you get to know him and if he if you're in his in a circle. Now, the one thing I did want to ask you and to make it a little bit more positive here is what's your favorite memory from being out there and playing the show? Um, if you can remember. Probably, probably walk, I would say two. One is walking into that new tribe and Sipe being there and knowing I had the tarpaulin and the numbers, so I, I would probably be safe for at least one night. Um, but I think it's Island of Secrets. I think spending that time, I was dry, which meant I was warm. Um, I didn't have to battle people. It was only myself and the elements, and that was what it was all about. I mean, I, I want to go and apply to Bear, Bear Island, um, the island with Bear Grylls. Being a British yep. citizen, I'm hoping I, it says you have to be a British resident, but I'm going to try and work on that. I would love to do that because for me, it's actually about being on the island and trying to keep your group as strong as possible. It's against my nature to try and single someone out or pick on the weak guy. That's just not who I am. So for me, the island is more my personality. Try and make the tribe as strong as possible and all work as hard as possible so that we thrive. So for me, it was those days where I could just be with the island, the island of secrets, yeah. and 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 the pos the new possibilities of my second tribe. They they were my highlight. And um, do you remain a fan of the show after you've played it? Will you be watching the new season coming out in June? Absolutely. And my my one son has just gone to um, to um, Vietnam, and he's left me his Mnet. Um, codes for TV. So now for the first right. time in 20 years, I've got DSTV. <laughs> I'm actually going to be able to watch Survivor live. I'm so excited. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to be coming oh, awesome. the time. I've never had live TV before. Oh, that's awesome. I'll, I'll be looking out for it. Uh, Tanya, I want to thank you for your time today to come on the show and talk a little bit about your experience on the show. I love the fact that you're such a positive person. You know, you've taken a lot of positivity from the season and that you remain a fan after all of this as well. And I just want to say as a fan who watched the show, I really enjoyed seeing you on the show. I know that Riley, my co-host, who sadly can't be here tonight, he was really looking forward to meeting you as well. He's from Australia. He's a big fan as well, you know, and um, he's he's got the flu. So we're just hoping it's not anything more serious than that, especially in the times that we've had in the last couple of um, months. But um, yeah, I really have enjoyed having you on the show. And um, I'm sure we'll be in touch in the near future. In any case, I'd love to stay in touch and see what you're getting up to. If you're down at uh, Bear, Bear Grylls Island, if you're doing that, I'll be keeping an eye for that because I think that would be amazing. Um, now, guys, if you've listened to this, um, to this, I'm in a few seconds from now, I'm going to be back and I'm going to recap anything that myself and Tanya did not talk about in these two episodes. And we'll be back Come shortly. All right, we're back. So that was Tanya Copeland on Survivor Global here at Reality Pop. And she had some great insights um, on the, the interview just there. But there is obviously a few things we haven't touched on in this episode um, that we want to go through here at the end. And it's going to be a little bit different from what you've normally seen on the podcast so far, because normally I am joined by my co-host, Riley, or any of the other uh, guest co-hosts that I have as well. But uh, Riley sadly couldn't make it, um, feeling a bit under the weather here today. So we've given him the day off. Now, other things here in episode five that stood out for me was that Nathan and Rob both took time here at the challenge to sit out and talk to each other. Um, and clearly that uh, Saula Strong Amigos Alliance is still going to stay strong because they keep giving each other information at this stage to tell uh, each other what's happening in both of their tribes. So that's something to look out for in the future. Nathan states here at this point that he is going to try and go out after one of the guys there, um, Jeffrey Mike or potentially a mubba in his tribe. So he may throw the next challenge. So he's very confident in his position in that Saula tribe at this stage. Tahalo uh, wins the reward ultimately, and they get to go to the smoothie bar here at episode five, which uh, creates a great scene here with Meryl and Dante being in the smoothie bar, trying to get 
the clue to the hidden immunity idol, which is hidden behind the, funny enough, I think it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, the immunity booster plate or sign within this movie bar. So Meryl ends up going and gets Dante's help, and she distracts the rest of the tribe where they're looking somewhere at one of the islands, and Dante very quickly goes and grabs the clue, which I thought was gr great play between these two allies um, in the game. We also see here that Doral is in the hunt for a new alliance member. And Doral decides that he's going to go after Jark as being that person that he could work on within the tribe. And I think it's a brilliant um, move by Doral. You know, the first time I watched the season with Doral in it, um, I feel like I actually liked him from the start, but a lot of people um, maybe wouldn't have appreciated his game as much um, as I did. And I think this stands out that Doral really understands where the, the balance and power is and who the people are that he needs to get in with to try and stay in the game. He's obviously the only person and from his original lines there on his own and him and Sipe alone are two the only two people against three people at this stage within the bigger alliance in his tribe so by going to Jark and becoming an ally um, he also goes to the person in that original tribe that was sort of on the outs with the rest of that tribe he already burned a bit of social capital by playing his idol early on um, and you know Jark is looking for allies at this time and, and I think Jark is one of the few players that actually has a, a strategic mind outside of Sipe obviously being one of those but Sipe is a little bit more comfortable with her relationships that she's got um, in that other tribe Another thing here as well is that, you know, in the challenge, Jark struggles um, to put the sliding puzzle together. And um, the first time I watched it, I was wondering, you know, Jark really put his hand hands up here to say, I'm somebody that's extremely good at doing challenges. I can do it in less than 90 seconds, quite confident saying, can someone record it? And, you know, he rightfully says afterwards that it was embarrassing um, that this happened on, on national TV and now international TV, because a lot of people internationally are watching the Survivor um, seasons now um one of the things that people may not be aware of but if you are a super fan you surely would have been on the reddit um, post or you would have listened to our um is that that challenge was actually always uh, it was designed to fail because they could put in the pieces in any, any order that they wanted. So the order that he put it in actually did matter. And when they put the pieces into that puzzle, it was impossible for Jack to actually complete that puzzle. So it wasn't because Jack wasn't capable of doing it. It was just an impossible puzzle to do in the first place. But I think the really big thing that stands out here is that Felix is seen as not being a team player. And he trash talks Jack throughout this whole um period of trying to put the puzzle together and um, that is not seen as very favorable by someone like a CPA or the rest of his alliance and in Survivor you only have to give somebody a little bit of a reason to vote you out you know and if uh, you give them the reason they, they're going to bury you and that's really what happened here with Felix by trash talking Jackie instead of being supportive so because of this Lame does end up um, having to go to Tribal um, and it is pretty evident here you know there's a few shenanigans happening with um, Doral wanting to to um, use this fake idol or something and Sipe doesn't like it very much. He says, just make it a simple vote. Let's not rub it in his face. But they do end up going into tribal here. And I think that, you know, they make the right decision by voting Felix out. A lot of tribes and survivors sometimes will keep a very disruptive person in there. But I don't think Felix was ever really going to vote with the rest of the misfits um, in this alliance. I think that if he was ever to link up back with Dante or the Merrill or somebody like that, or like, um, you know, Tanya said in this podcast, earlier he was going to go back to the cool kids you know he was one of the in people so i don't think he was going to work with them long term so um no loss for them there to actually end up voting him out episode six comes around and episode six six is a very interesting one you know you you have the misfits here forming the the official alliance name the misfits is created and you have tanya jack sipe and Dural in that alliance they now realize they only have four people left in the game and that they are going to have to work with um some of the majority groups in the other tribes if they want to get somewhere and sipe quite correct correctly reads here that if they do go into a merge, they're the easy target because they don't have the numbers. So they're going to have to make a very strategic move here in regards to who they are going to send to the Island of Secrets. Jack also takes the time here and he does say to the rest of the group that he's got some armory, he's got a hidden immunity idol and also an advantage that can be used at the merge. Now, if you've listened to any of my previous um, podcasts, you would be aware that 
I'm someone that is not in favor of um, you ever telling the rest of your tribe that you've got an idol or a hidden immunity um, or advantage or anything like that. But in this case, I do understand why Jack had to do it. He needed to give his alliance a reason to keep him. And this is going to become very valuable towards the end of the episode because, you know, Jack is someone that has burned some bridges in regards to um, being shown as playing quite strategic or sneaky in the sense that he played that idol earlier in the season. So he needs to have something else to bring to the table when he goes into the merge. You know, Doral's got some great relationships with his previous alliance and that makes him valuable to potentially have an in with those guys. And Sipe, obviously, um, as part of the Amigos, um, is very strongly in that group with Rob and um, his crew. So there's a, a case that can be made here for a lot of these people to to stay in the tribe. And obviously, Tani ultimately is the person that's going to get voted out here in the end because they're looking her, at her as a person that's not great at building um, social bonds and relationships in the game. And she just doesn't have anything of value for this group going into the merge if they were to merge. Now, we also hear in this episode that Quibbers um, is very aware that Nathan tried to throw the challenge in the previous episode. So Quibbers is saying that, listen, Nathan's got a bad attitude he's a bit of a princess or a prince i can't remember the exact wording um in the tribe so clearly he's got a bit of a negative attitude that's rubbing off on the rest of the tribe i mean quibbers even says it's great not to have nathan here when nathan goes to the um island of secrets because it means that i'm gonna have one night without debbie downer um or the person that's down in my tribe now, Quibbers is saying that if they don't win the next challenge and if Nathan doesn't get things correct here, that he will vote Nathan out. So Nathan's got a bad read on Quibbers here because in the previous episode, he told um, Rob that Quibbers is very firmly working with him, but clearly Quibbers is not on the same page here. And um, Quibbers is a very interesting character and remains to be an interesting character um, throughout these episodes. Now, Nathan and Nicole get selected to go to the Island of Secrets, and they're being sent to the Island of Secrets by um, Sipe, which is a very strategic move from her part, and it's a really good move, in my opinion. Sipe wants to show that she is still Amigo strong, and that's why she made that move. And she even got the rest of the group to agree to that because um, Tanya and Jack don't really have an in with their previous lines as much. They were never really in that in group, especially Jack after playing the idol, uh, the idol as well. And um, they need numbers when they go to the merch. So great move here. Nathan and Nicole being on the island, they bond a little bit. Nathan, um, you know, explains to her how hard the game has been. And clearly, um, like we heard from Paul in the first episode that we did, um, that he had some other things going on there potentially at home that was difficult and weighing on his mind. So mentally, um, it seems that he is struggling even more so than with his foot because you don't really see his foot come into play too often in these challenges anymore. So, um, you know, he's really struggling. He's talking to Nicole. Nicole's telling him what's going on in his tribe um, and that Nicole and Rob is very much in the bottom and that they believe that Rocco, Dante, and Letitia and Meryl are a group. So that would put them solidly at the bottom and they only have one idol between the two of them. So Nathan is quite shocked by this, but he does agree that the best person to use the full idol because they got two halves of the idol would be Nicole. She should take that back. Very selfless um, move by, by Nathan here and the career read from Nathan to um, potentially give that idol to Nicole if they were in the bottom. The only problem is, is that he doesn't have any power. So, I mean, I take my hat off to him. You need numbers in this game. Um, it would be tough. I don't know if I would have gone down that same road to give the power away. I feel like I would have said, you keep one, I keep one, and we see where we get. If we get to the merge, then maybe at that point we can do something together. Um, who knows? It's it's tough. It's it's easy to critique when you're on the sidelines here. Um, the other big thing here that happens is that um, Lomay, oh, sorry, Nicole goes back to the camp and Nicole says that listen, um, there's a bit of a lie that she needs to tell because they're going to expect something with her coming back from the island of secrets. Um, and she says to them that she got a half of an idol and a clue to an idol and that Nathan got to choose a tablet which was on the table and he could phone home and he heard really bad news from home so that made her quite emotional and she really um, shows that she can cry on point here which is quite dangerous um, it looks like she fools Rob but no one else and Dante especially is not fooled by this and he says that most of his stories starts from an emotional place and then it just escalates from there and there's a scene with Dante Letitia and also um, Rocco talking about that afterwards. So the lie ends up working to a certain degree here because they needed to hear something, I guess, um, and they don't know if she's got a full idol. Um, 
they do mention and Meryl mentions that, you know, it's kind of fishy that the clue isn't there um, to sort of confirm what she said the whole thing was with the idol. So a lot of people being skeptical and you should be skeptical because it's Survivor. Um, but she feels like she got a she pulled it off. And listen, regardless, who cares? Both of them have got an idol. They're safe. They're not going anywhere in the near future. So great on Nicole. Great on her to be able to get Nathan to give her that idol. And again, it shows that Nicole is a very strong um, social player um, and she is really good at getting her way in this game up until this point. And um, she's in a position of strength moving forward here. Now, the other big thing of this episode is also Dante realizing that he needs to get rid of Rob. And um, he's got this bit of a vendetta that's going up against Rob and he decides to go and hide the flint. Now, the first time I watched the absolutely loved it and again this time as well absolutely love it if you listen to this rob at any time i love you as a winner i love you as a player and i know this hurt you to your core but this is great tv to see people do this there's not many players that are willing to go and sabotage their own tribe for strategic gain you know obviously some of the most iconic moments would probably be like a russell hans going and um you know burning jason's socks or throwing the water out of the canteen um this is pretty drastic because you're taking fire away from people so it means big old rocco can't eat um rob can't eat rob doesn't have that um grip on the tribe that he had because he's the fireman he's got the flint with him so if he goes the fire goes kind of thing so um really love this play here from dante and again it shows that dante is very aware of what he needs to do to get to the end and he realizes that rob has got connections and other tribes as well so when they get together he's going to be difficult to stop you know um you've got to give credit to dante for being able to read this very correctly very early on in the season now Lome once again goes and loses the immunity um here for a third time in a row and it does mean that the four misfits has to go back to tribal once again and it is sad to see. Like, I really wanted the Misfits to pull it out and stay together, um, but it's not going to happen. And they have Tribal Council in their camp before they even go to Tribal Council, which made Tribal Council itself a little bit anticlimactic. I don't know if anybody who watched this episode was actually thinking anything else was going to happen, but I was pretty convinced that Tanya was out here. It made absolutely no strategic sense um, to anybody else in the game to vote Jack out if he's got an idol and he's got that advantage that gives them an extra vote that could help the group. You know, information is powerful. Knowing where the idol is in the game is powerful. You could have made a big move here. You could have taken Jark out. Obviously, it would have been seen as legendary to a certain degree or a very big move. But I feel like as a group, with these guys wanting to move as a group to the end, it does not make sense. You know, um, on this channel, Reality Pop, we are going to have the top 10 strongest alliances up pretty soon. And um, this is for the US Survivor. And one of the things that, you know, we took into consideration there is like some of the strongest alliances have been like, um, you know, the Aussie... Um, <laughs> Sam, Sandra, um, Becky, and uh, Ozzy, and and Yule Alliance. That alliance was quite small, and they got to the end because they trusted each other so 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 closely. And then I believe it was Foa Foa with the Russell Hans one. There were four people that went to the end. Like it shows that when these small groups can work very very closely together, and if there is trust and there is an idol that they can work with, that they can get themselves out of the bottom. When you're in such a big disadvantage in the numbers, you have to keep people there with ammunition. So Jack's argument throughout this whole phase, saying, "Listen, I've got a bag of tricks." I'm bringing this into the merge was the perfect move here to try and keep them with him as they move on to the merge. Now, guys, it's been two great episodes. I know that the format of what we're doing at the moment is quite different, and we're spending a little bit less time talking about the actual episodes versus having some of these players come in here and talk about their experiences. Um, it is something that we are wanting to do for this season before we move into the new season of Survivor South Africa, um, and uh, it's something we're playing around with, but with the actual season coming up, we'll obviously have more of a recap, so we hope you guys are going to stick around for the recaps and some of our insights um, on those episodes as well. If this is something that you like and uh, you, you want to see more of this content coming up in the future, we've got plenty of Survivor South Africa. Um, we've got plenty of international interviews coming up. Fingers crossed um, we might have a, a Survivor Australian legend um, interview, surprise interview dropping down as well. Um, and we're looking forward to that very much. So please hit the subscribe button if you like this content. Please hit the notification bell. Um, we will continue to do this 
every single week. And there's great content for US Survivor. There's great content for International Survivor. Um, I'm also a part of the Challenge podcast. So if you watch the Challenge All Stars by any chance, um, that is currently a, a show that I'm recapping with Chantal Francis. Chantal Francis is also doing the Big Brother Canada coverage at the moment. So a lot happening. If you're someone that loves reality TV and you've got a show you'd love to talk about um, and you think that you've got what it takes to jump on one of these podcasts, please give us a shout. Um, send us an email um, at realitypopnetwork at gmail.com and let us know why you would be great on one of these shows. And who knows, I might be doing a podcast with you in the near future. If you've been here until this point, I thank you and I will talk to you pretty soon on the next recap of Survivor Island of Secrets. Goodbye.